Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Zola Levitt presents Considering the times and seasons of our world today, here's Zola Levitt. Shalom. Hello again. We've been very fortunate lately in attracting some major spokesmen on the Middle East, and uh, we have one of those tonight. Joan Peters wrote the book, From Time Immemorial. This is a textbook used in uh, the United States and in Israel. Uh, it's a voluminous copy on the origins of the Arab-Jewish conflict over Palestine, as she says on the cover. She was the White House advisor on American foreign policy in the Middle East during the Carter administration. She's lectured at the U.S. State Department and at foreign policy institutions in the U.S. and abroad. She's been on 200 radio and uh, television discussion shows. She's conducted fact-finding missions to Israel, Syria, Egypt, etc. CBS News documentaries, I could go on and on, contributed to Harper's Commentary, New Republic, New Leader. She's a member of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy based in New York. We sat her down and asked her her reason for writing from time immemorial. I had no intention of writing this book. Really? Yeah. No, none whatever. Yeah. Uh, I was asked by Doubleday as a result of an article I did uh -huh. in Harper's Magazine uh -huh. to write a book about the Arab refugees and the Arab-Jewish conflict. Yes. And uh, at that time they were called Arab refugees. Yes. They weren't called Palestinians. The only Palestinians were Jews. Yeah, I should clarify for our audience. When you say Palestinian, you use the term correctly from that time, 1948 to 1970 or so. Uh, when you say Palestinians, you're talking about Jewish people. And way before. And way uh, before. Always, yeah. always. Yeah. Um, in the 10th century, there was a synagogue of the Palestinians in Cairo that used to send around the world for uh, collections to be sent to Jerusalem for Jews who were keeping the patriarchate there, even though they lost their political homeland, they were still maintaining the religious patriarchate of Jerusalem. Yeah, and I remember somebody saying the Arabs resisted the term Palestinians at first. They didn't want to have it up to 1948. They said, don't call us Palestinians. No, well, after 48. All right, well, way, way after. But they hated the term because it was the Jews that were the Palestinians. Exactly. The Jerusalem Post was called the Palestine Post. Exactly. Yeah. They wanted to be called Southern Syrians or oh, yeah, um, yeah. Ottomans yeah. or Arabs or the greater Arab nation, mm -hmm. anything but Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And then they began to realize they couldn't get the Israelis out of their land by, by military means. And so they began to incorporate this robbery of a persona. Yeah. When the UN divided up, well, they made a Jewish homeland anyway, and it really started out to include what we now call Jordan. Isn't that so? Everything. Everything from the, the Hejaz, which is the Arabian Peninsula, to the Mediterranean was supposed to be the Jewish national home. And then they lopped off part of it, and that was called the Kingdom of Jordan. Uh -huh. And in fact, the Arab-Palestinian state of Jordan became a Palestinian state of Jordan only 1946, only two years before the Jewish-Palestinian state of Israel came to be internationally recognized in 1948. Yeah. And you went over here. Your original purpose was different than the way the book came out. As I did the research, I found out, Zola, that there was no truth to all of the conventional wisdom that State Department handouts were giving me. I found that the textbooks I'd been reading were missing all the information I was getting. And I had a file that was so voluminous of knots in my, uh, I mean, N-O-T, yes. apostrophe S. Yes. Things that weren't things true. Things that weren't yeah. true. Yeah. That the whole fabric of the outline I'd given to Doubleday unraveled. And I had to give back the, um, I, I called them and I said, you know, I really have to tell you that everything I thought I knew, I didn't know. 
For example, I didn't know there were Jewish refugees that were numbering more than the Arab refugees who supposedly left Israel. She said, what do you mean supposedly? I said, well, uh, why would they change the definition of a refugee for Arabs only so that if only two years had been spent in Israel before the state was uh, declared in internationally by the United Nations, why would they say that they only had to be there two years in order to have status as a refugee and get the rations and the benefits of a refugee? Mm -hmm. All over the world, all refugees have been resettled, rehabilitated after the great wars. Yes. They have never had their definition changed. They were long-lived residents who had been forced to flee for their lives, who had no funds of any kind, although they had had it confiscated by the government. Of course, all those things applied in other situations. In the Arab situation, there was no such thing. Mm -hmm. The Arabs had arrived to get the benefits of the Jewish settlements. The Arabs had arrived to get the better health uh, conditions that were operative in all of the areas of employment under the Jewish industry. And the Jewish industry was a fledgling industry at that time. It was operating with a war deficit of five countries attacking it in 1948. Yes. Mm -hmm. Arab countries who wanted it to be thrown into the sea. Of course, when I went to investigate Arab refugees, I thought they were being treated like the American blacks. I had been a civil rights activist, and I felt that the Arabs were being treated in that same way. Mm -hmm. And I was really identifying the Arabs, these Arab, quote, refugees, unquote, with the black, Afri the American black Africans, mm -hmm. what we call the Native American Africans. We had so much misconception poured into us by the newspapers, mm -hmm. by the textbooks, by the radio, by the television news, by even the greatest experts we had, because I hadn't found the experts I use in my book. I told all this to Doubleday's editor, mm -hmm. and she said, wait a minute, you're talking about many years of research. I can't hold out that kind of time for this book. And I said, I'll, I'll send back your advance. I can't do this book. I'm going to do it <laughs> if I can get the, the strength. Mm -hmm. And um, I will come to you when it's finished. And if you still want it, or if you do want it, it's going to have a knot in front of everything that was in my outline. Gosh, okay. So to recap, you, you contracted with Doubleday to write a book basically about the mistreatment of the Arabs and how their privation, and that they were in straits like uh, blacks in America of the time and so on. And, and I ended up finding out not, not, not. The things weren't true. The Arabs weren't mistreated. They weren't uh, uh, refugees, really. They, they, it was not their land. Is that what you found out? What I found out is that they have been mistreated by the Arab countries. They have been victims of the Arab countries. Of their own leadership. They mm -hmm. have, of their leadership and of the Arab countries that have made them into, well, you know, I use the term in what I thought was a virtual not a literal way in my book when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. That I, I said that the Arab Palestinian refugees have become a human bomb in the war against Israel. Mm -hmm. But it never occurred to me in my wildest nightmares that I would be talking about a literal human baby bomb. Mm. Never in my wildest no, nightmares. Oh, I wouldn't think. And here it's become a human bomb in the literal sense. It's horrifying beyond, it's monstrous. And yet it comes down to us now as, as some, the, the Arabs saying the Jewish people are occupying our land. That's exactly right. They've turned the complete history on its head. They have, in fact, <laughs> robbed the Jews of their own persona. They have literally taken word for word the descriptions of what happened in 
pre-Israel Palestine, and they have simply substituted the term Arab for the term Jewish. And when you hear it and you know better, it's mind-blowing. I bet it is. It's a, it's a scam. It's a bogus claim that somehow has gotten the romantic notions of the world against all logic. Who are the Palestinians that they should command so much importance that the life and death of the world's peace might depend on it? It is a scam, and it must be exposed. And yet, uh, I was telling you before we sat down, the American Airlines addressed a frequent flyer statement to a friend of mine in Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem held territories, H-E-L-D, territories. Good heavens. A private business has bought the story. It sounds like the State Department. <laughs> you, were, you were involved with the State Department. You were well, in I the Carter lecturing. administration. Yes, I, I lectured in the State Department when my book came out. And uh, they invited me to lecture all over the world, wherever, whatever country I was in, and go to the embassies and talk to the people. And uh, I did. I, I did talk to State Department personnel. And what came out very loud and clear was that some of them understood very well that the United States had to stop paying the millions, tens of millions, I think it's even billions now, in money to the refugee camps that are keeping these people human bombs. And they had to take that same money and do a little bit like what uh, Jack Kemp, who was our uh, congressman in the recent years, he said they ought to have a Marshall Plan. They ought to immediately set about putting all kinds of money into the East Bank of Jordan. There have been other proposals to have the land of Saudi Arabia given over a portion of it, which would be very close to the Arab Muslims, yes. give a portion of that land to the Palestinian Arabs because they don't have enough land for a country. It certainly would make sense, wouldn't it? Uh, they speak uh, the language, they worship the God, uh, they would be comfortable in Saudi Arabia. Well, anyway, the State Department uh, was very mixed. Most of them stood up and walked out when I was speaking. Oh. The ones who stayed, <laughs> stayed to the end, and they stood on their feet and applauded, and then came over and said, what can we do to help? Of course, nothing was done, but no, I was familiar was... with the State Department. The State Department has always had its own axis mm -hmm. against Israel. Yes, it really does, doesn't it? Uh, President Carter, who we mentioned, uh, you worked in his administration, has recently pronounced, along with President Bush, that, uh, to create a Palestinian nation, that that's the solution to this uh, peace process. Well, they want, if they want to create a second Palestinian state, then they can look to Saudi Arabia, or if Iraq was uh, leaderless and they found a new leader who could create a democracy, they could certainly apportion a part of that state of Iraq to some Kurds and to Arab Palestinians. Okay, now when you say a second Palestinian state, you're referring to Jordan as the first Palestinian state. Well, it is. Not to Israel. I'm referring to Jordan, yeah. right, of course. Okay. That is easy to mix up, but of course not to anyone but people who have heard. Uh, I'm so inured to the propaganda that I immediately thought Jordan, but what you say is so true. You have to be very specific. Yeah, they have almost established. Well, even, you know, I've, I've gone to Israel for, for years and years and taken tours. I'm pretty familiar with the situation. But even when I first started out, I thought, well, this was a, an Arab land here. The Jews did, a, of course, live here in Bible days, and their, their artifacts are there. And there's no question of that. But then they were dispersed, after all. And then the world felt, uh, after the Holocaust and so on, they deserved some territory. And, and what better territory than the one they were in? But it did displace all these poor Arabs and so forth. And I bought the story, hook, line, and sinker. And like you, I was <laughs> brought up short. I, I had a revelation that uh, this was not <laughs> Arab land, really was never. The Jews have always been there. There was never Palestinian land. There no, was never there was... a country of Palestine. No, there no, never no. has been any land called Palestinian land. It simply didn't happen until Oslo, when Israel gave them some land in return for peace.
Which, because <laughs> they wanted peace so desperately that even that tiny little patch of land they had, they were willing to share, even though they knew that it was a bogus claim, because they wanted so badly to have peace. Mm -hmm. And what did they do? They, it exploded in the faces of everybody. Yes. And the UN and, and Europe, the media, I could just go on and on. They, they buy the story. They, they're into the same story. Well, the Kingdom of Jordan was a fact that King Abdullah, and he, actually King Abdullah labeled the land Kingdom of Palestine. He said, we will call our land the Kingdom of Palestine. And he was assassinated. Yeah, the little name didn't stick, did it? <laughs> and when the Arab Palestinians in 1970, who were newly called Arab Palestinians, tried to take over Jordan, 10,000 of them were slaughtered with the assistance of Israel because Israel was trying to be a good guy and be loved. And they wanted to help Jordan. But what they didn't realize is that nobody's ever going to love Israel. And Israel's going to have to stay strong until Islam reforms. And that's going to take a while. Ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, and our catalog with videos, books, and music. Our correspondence course, the Institute of Jewish Christian Studies, includes reading packets, teaching cassettes, and mail-in tests. Did you know that Zola takes tours to Israel, Greece, and the Holy Land Experience theme park in Orlando, Florida? Please contact us for more information. The Israel we see on our tours is quite different than the Israel you see on CNN, that's for sure, and the rest of the media. Um, I went on with uh, Joan Peters. She, she is such a, a brilliant spokesman, and I, I have a, I'm developing a taste in who says what here after Joseph Fair and Cal Thomas, uh, people like that. Uh, she can hold uh, her own with all of them. A wonderful author and a wonderful speaker. Uh, Joan, you know, the one Arab leader always credited with a uh, successful peace process was uh, Anwar Sadat, and I understand you met him. Oh, yes. We were friends, mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, because the first article I wrote on my first journey there to uh, do an article ended up being a series of articles, and um, at that time, it was right after the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Egyptians and the Syrians had uh, attacked Israel on Yom Kippur, their holiest holiday. And um, a few days after the attack, there was already a group of press who were saying that Egypt was fighting for the sake of peace. Uh, which seemed to me somehow to be an oxymoron. Yeah. Either you're fighting or you're not fighting. Yeah. But he was in this wonderful, uh, benevolent, uh, officious kind of uh, almost, uh, it was almost unctuous way. He said, we are fighting for the sake of peace. And um, they claimed that they even saw Jewish textbooks in the windows of a bookstore in Cairo. Uh, by this time, I'd already found out about the Jewish refugees who had had to flee from e Egypt. Mm -hmm. I found out that there were 950,000 some Jewish refugees. Almost a million people. Arab, yes. Mm. Arab-born Jews whose families had been there for some of them, literally from time immemorial. Yes. They had flown the coop because they were being threatened for their very lives. The Arabs were stealing their property, so they fled or were killed after a history that had been marked by persecution and second-class citizenship at best. Back to Sadat. Yes. Sadat was a very brilliant man. And he understood what a lot of the State Department people didn't, that you had to deceive, but when the time came, if you got what you wanted, you had to produce the goods. Mm -hmm. And he did that. Mm -hmm. 
Look, this peace process seems to take precedence over everything else to where we're bowing down to, to our very enemies, like you just described. Flattering, I mean, the president has a Saudi prince at his ranch. Uh, the, the FBI director goes to lunch with, the, with virtually the enemy. I don't know how else to say it. What is going on? I, I mean, you're an American. <laughs> how do you look at that? Well, I wish I could answer that question. I, it, I'm afraid it takes a psychiatrist mm. to answer it. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I can't understand why we have lost our backbone. Uh, I think there is a kind of mindset that is almost visceral that has to be broken, which is that the Arabs are important to this country. Mm -hmm. What's important to this country is that the Arabs not be important to this country. The Arab Muslims have been up to no good. They have been destroying their own people in camps. They've been destroying Israel's fiber and morale by the very fact that they insist on, as they put it, keeping the Arabs in camps so that they keep their hatred alive against Israel. Mm -hmm. Their textbooks are printed with virulent anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And the children who grow up today, as you see on television, the Arab children speak of Jews as vermin. Mm -hmm. They call Jews awful names. Mm -hmm. And they say it on American news broadcasts when they show clippings. We must understand that we have to do a turnaround. We started the turnaround here. The president really tried to start the turnaround. But the thing that worries me is that he's very susceptible to public opinion. And I'm worried about how easily public opinion can be, is fickle and can be changed. And how important it is for people like you who have your show to be out there as you are telling the truth about the bogus claim that exists because it's not only Israel that stands to be destroyed. This Israel is a segment of the world population that the Muslim world wants to destroy. Mm -hmm. When I was in Gaza, I spoke to one of the top Muslim leaders there. He said there were no legal borders from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, that all borders were illegal. I said, what about the Muslim countries of Egypt and Syria? And he said, they're not Muslim countries. They have technology that the West has. They have many elements of themselves which are westernized. They are the great Satan. They must be de-Satanized. Oh but he said this in a very quiet, English voice. Uh -huh. It was an educated, it was a quiet, it was well modulated, and it was deadly. And he said that to me 10 years ago in Gaza. It's uh, <laughs> what you call in your book turn speak, this, this, this propaganda. It's turning everything on its head. In other words, he says they're modern, they're up to date, they're like the Americans or the Israelis, so they're no good. Right. That's upside down. Well, first, they're not modern. They're not up to date. No, they're not. Of but course. I, and he accuses them of this of as course. if it is a crime. Well, because he's not, they're not under extremist Muslim control yet. But they're taking a lot of their, an awful lot of their dictates from the Muslims. They are, the extremist Muslims run the schools. The Saudis pay for the schools. The schools are in the mosques. If they dare to deviate, from the curriculum that the Saudis, that the extremist Saudi religious community wants to dictate, they will be destroyed. The Saudis have bought and paid for the militancy and deadly monstrosity of the human but, bombers. But the Saudis are described as our friends by the president. That's where we have the fatal flaw. Call the psychiatrist. That's where we have the fatal flaw. I don't know that it's that I think there have been a lot of people who are still in government who have made a lot of money through the Saudi uh -huh. government and it's very difficult to separate out the interests that are private and the interests that are good for this nation. Yeah, we, we quoted uh, Daniel Pipes, uh, who's quite a, a spokesman. Uh, a very eloquent yeah, spokesman. Quite. And he 
he testified before Congress and he said in plain words, the Saudis actually brag out loud about if we uh, demonstrate to our American friends that we can be very good friends indeed, especially when they leave office, it's uh, much easier to deal with them when they enter office. In other words, if we dangle the bribe out there, we'll get them to do things our way. Is it that bad? Yes. Yes, it's that bad. You know, the Lord uh, described a time as bad as we have now in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, where his disciples asked him, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? He said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. That was after he said, you'll hear wars and rumors of wars, nation rise against nation, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. It's really, really a tough, a bad time, a time rather like we have now. And this is the identifying verse. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Who's you? Well, he's talking to Israeli Jews, his disciples. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I think Israel's the only country that could qualify with being hated of all nations. Even the North Koreans and the Chinese and the Iraqis have friends. Israel has no friends other than the friends in Washington. And many times I wonder about them. And it goes on about... Uh, betrayals and iniquity and so on. It's very, very reminiscent of our age. You know, I could quote uh, Johnny Cash, Matthew 24 is knocking at the door. <laughs> He's saying that once and we should remember that. Uh, we're living in the times that the Lord described, to my knowledge, as the end. Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer this week, Is Fanatic Islam a Global Threat? A compelling study of Islam, offering proof that this is the major force of destabilization in the world today. This book cuts through the media's rhetoric to the hard, cold facts confronting all of us. Is Fanatic Islam a Global Threat? A must-read for $15. Each month, our free Levitt letter brings you updates on recent events, in-depth articles, Hebrew lessons, and special offers. Also ask about the Levitt Letter Extra. This cutting-edge, rush-printed newsletter is mailed first class or emailed immediately after any important event. The Levitt Letter Extra is the perfect supplement to Zola's free newsletter, The Levitt Letter. Please call 1-800-WONDERS. That's 1-800-966-3377. Or write to Zola, Box 12268, Dallas, Texas 75225. When you're on the internet, visit Zola's website, www.levitt.com. Zola Levitt Presents depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.